Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. They call it the meatpacking district, or they call it the West Village. But all I know is everybody, everybody from around the world wants to go to this district. They got an Apple store, they have these hotels, they got these restaurants, they got these condominiums, they got these new luxury condominiums. So what's happening in this meatpacking district, which all of a sudden became Boomtown? Today, I have brought together four people who understand the Meatpacking District, and they'll give us, and the West Chelsea uh, and West Village, to provide their insight. My guests include um, Joe McMillan, who is the CEO of DDG Partners, Jared Epstein, who is a vice president at Aurora Capital, Paul Parisa, who is the co-founder and the co-CEO of Taconic Investment Partners, and last but not least, how could I have a show on that market without having Stephen Whitkoff, who is the the Grand Poopa, the chairman of the Whitkoff Group. So, oh, Grand Poopa of the market, why do you like the meat market? Why, why did it take you so long to get into that market? I mean, you've been in the investment market for over 25 years, and now you're finally building something there? We're, we're going to build a, um, a residential property there, a condo property there, and it's vibrant. There's a nucleus. We love um, the Hudson River Park. And you should thank him. I mean, you should thank him. Uh, you know, the Caledonia. Well, that's, part, that's part of my answer. <laughs> part of my answer is that it took us a while to figure out what Paul saw um, well earlier than we did, certainly. Um, but it's a great area, and, and, and personally, I'd like to move down there. I don't know who's older, you or Paul or me. Paul's a lot older. He's okay. a lot older than me. You must be older than both of us, I hope. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to be, you know, <laughs> aged over here. And I was telling that story about when I went to the meat packing, the meat district over 35 years ago in Bankers Trust, it was a totally different world. But you were there, you were like the new kid. What happened, 1997? <laughs> you found a little building, a small building, 111 8th Avenue, the Port Authority, this dilapidated piece of crap. You, you had the vision. What happened? Well, <clears throat> those early days of, uh, of Taconic, really, we, we didn't go there because it was the meatpacking district. We go there because it was a gigantic chunk of New York City real estate. And my basic principle was if you can own large floor plates and accommodate large tenants in a, in a, in a fundamentally sound building, it, 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 you can really make a splash. It's on a subway station, et cetera. The actual meatpacking district to the immediate south uh, was a dilapidated mess. It was a, it was a really hard place to hang. In fact, there was some, some safety issues, but we felt somewhat that the 111 8th as a unique asset was worthy. What be, and that was 97. From 97, 98, 2000, 2001, the market changed dramatically 
and we really saw the but potential. What was the, what was the change? I, I mean, as you said to me, uh, Mr. Epstein over here is uh, the alleged guru of what, you know, the, he, he's like the, uh, the social networking media. The maven investment of, ferret. Uh, the investment <laughs> ferret of the market. But, you know, he's too young uh, for that period of time. What changed this? I mean, was it the, the evolution of 111 to 8th Avenue? Was it uh, the Chelsea markets? Uh, I still remember when I did a show, I think you might have even been on it, and I, I said to someone, I, I did a hotel show, and I said to the banker who financed the Gans Award, I said, why do you finance the Gans Award? He said it was simple. I didn't know if the guy could do well, but I knew that the guy who owned the land was in the hotel business, so I was very comfortable over there if I had to foreclose on it. Hmm. And that was in the early 2000s. That wasn't, you know. You have a, first of all, New York changed. In the, in the time that Steve and I were very active in the, in the 80s, in the early 90s, you really looked at a midtown and a downtown. You might have looked at Park Avenue South. New York wasn't as broadened as it is, as it became. As the things tightened over all of Manhattan, tenants, and I'm talking commercial tenants for the moment, began to look at wherever they can get space that was accessible with the proper kind of accommodation and space. That was the premise of 111. Residentially, it's interesting to note that while the Upper East Side and West Side and the traditional areas are fabulous, big family areas, the highest price per foot over the last couple of years has been in the West Village in Tribeca, in, down, in these downtown corridors. It became a cooler place to live, a cooler place to be. Steve's timing is going to be magnificent, I think. Joe's timing, magnificent in their residential developments. Um, all of us are here because this Meat Park Pack District is very cool. It's really pretty buildings. There's a, you know, the cobblestones, you got the High Line Park. You've got an area which can't but be better as time goes on. And, and, and so we're fortunate to have been in early, all of us. There's still trading going on. Prices have gotten high. I think the future of this district is going to be better and better. Jared, what do you see? You know, you, you know, we were joking with you that you're the investment ferret, you're, you're the leasing guy, you know. What's happening? What are, what are rents for retail? What are rents for office? What, what's really happening? And, and let's go to the district. And sure. we were also talking, I think Paul brought out, and I know that Joe will get involved with it, you know, this new bid, because the, the bid is really going to be very important to the neighborhood, the business improvement district. Sure. First, I'll talk about what we saw. Um, the corner of 13th and 9th, the southwest corner, directly across the street from the Gens of Ort, Caddy Cornered by the Soho House and Spice Market, next to Pastis. We saw this building that was dilapidated and just sitting there waiting for a developer to come. The owner of the property was also in the meatpacking business, the DeLuca <coughs> family. There, were, there was a, an RFP sent out or a broker that was marketing the property looking, looking for a tenant for a 15 to 20 year lease to take over this property. The, the problem was that the property was in disrepair. It required a huge influx of capital. Paul Pariser, myself, Ornado, everyone was looking at the property. The owner of the property didn't want to sell. She was only looking for a tenant. And luckily for us, the market changed. We were negotiating on a deal. The capital markets froze up, 2008, 2009, Lehman, Bear Stearns. We were there, we remained uh, focused on doing a deal with the landlord. We were able to negotiating, uh, negotiate a long-term master lease, 49 years. We saw that the, the neighborhood was going to continue to gentrify. It was before the High Line opened. The High Line did open, the market turned. We started building. But you know, 13th and 9th is like 13th, 14th and 9th. I mean, the, the best locations. It's that, the heart. It, it's the, that's truly the market. I mean, 111 yeah. 8th is 15th to 16th Street. It's a block away. It, it's a long block away, but I mean, the building's also a full block. Well, so, right. you know, but but the, the idea is with the gentrification, I mean, part of it is what Paul, when did the Apple store open up? I think about 2008 um, it opened up. We bought that building in 2005. But Jared's built, I mean, look, Apple, great corner, 14th and 9th. If you look at other great corners, and they're, and they're going to be on Ninth Avenue, and uh, Aurora saw the saw the opportunity. By the way, we saw that same opportunity. I just couldn't swallow a leasehold. 
I like fees. So. But Paul has a corner right down the block. And well, we have a fee. Be a phenomenal. And we have a fee down on Washington and 13th. Phenomenal. So, so you have another building over there. Well, now, we hope to get zoning for something. Now, you had mentioned you. The, we the were downstairs. showing the corner to tenant. Right, so the, we were, the tenant who is going to be downstairs is who? Is going to be Sephora. When we were negotiating for our deal, LVMH had, be look, had been looking for a site, had been looking for a flagship Maison, one of their flagship stores in the world. LVMH was trying to buy the building. The market crashed, they turned away. We knew that LVMH was still very interested in being there. At the time, they thought that the area was more appropriate for a Sephora store, not for LVMH. This was during the downturn. We got a deal with Sephora, we put it together, and Sephora is gonna be opening up one of their most unique stores in the entire chain, different than any Sephora in the world, because this market is different than any other market in the world. And, and then you're it's, gonna have something that's definitely unique in the neighborhood. Another okay. restaurant. Another restaurant. But another, another it's an upper floor restaurant, something that uh, is totally out of the box. <coughs> um, so like gonna be an we're all going to talk about the rents in the area are just, they've been surging, $300, $400 a foot. A restaurant can't survive on the ground floor. They decided that they were going to take a small lobby entrance and go up to a grand 12,000 square foot space with outdoor space. They uh, went for their liquor license, and CB2 is not very happy with the area continuing to house these nightclubs and restaurants, but luckily they are a great operator and they were able to receive their SLA approval. Mm. But don't expect to see too many additional restaurants in the neighborhood. McMillan, are you going to put a restaurant on your building on 9th Avenue? Uh, we don't plan to. I think um, our building I would expect to be luxury retail. Yours is at uh, 14th and 9th. We acquired it in 2010, started talking to the prior owner in 2009, looking at, you know, what Steve had done, um, you know, Steve, I'm sorry, what Paul had done, and uh, I think luxury retail, you know, you get three to $400 a foot is very doable there, and condominiums, we think, are, uh, are going to do extremely well. And the size of the units? Size of our units will range from one bedrooms to four bedrooms, say 1,200 square feet to, you know, 4,000, and, um, you know, we're 12 stories, uh, two stories of retail, and uh, we feel very, very good about it. And you... Um you're on what, 10th, 11th? 10th. 10th. You can join this business. I offer to. I, 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 offer I, to I agree, to, but what do you so, mean? he's in already. Don't oh, you, you're <laughs> in. So, so here's the question. When Superior Inc. opened, no one, even when you opened up the Caledonia with the people at Superior Inc., you didn't realize how many people wanted to live there. Right? How, how fast did you, you have, you had condos and you had retail. Well, rent. The, the, I'd say this, the, the traditional, the formal meatpacking district doesn't have much residential. And it's zoned M15, so they want hotels or commercial, retail, etc. So we are a very close site. We're a quarter block away. And we felt very strongly about it. We were very surprised on the upside. Our, our rents, we performed in the 60s. We wound up getting 80 some odd dollars a foot rent. And they continue to get the 80s? Strengthening. And our condo sales at $1,400 a foot blew out, and they're trading at 2,000 plus a foot. And it isn't to the quality that Steve is putting forth. Steve's site is crossing between meatpacking and the West Village. And the West Village, I think, is, is, is one of the, well, it is the most, one of the strongest condo and home ownership markets because so, it's so, fantastic. So, so you're building, his timing is so what are you building? 15 CPW of the, of the West Village? In the West Village Meatpacking District? Well, first of all, let me just pick up on what Paul said. It's interesting. The Post <laughs> ran an article. I want to say it was um, Kay, Sh Kay Schiller who did a mm -hmm. um, survey on the top 10 uh, uh, so uh, by socioeconomic standards zip codes in mm -hmm. the entire country. New York City, of course, had five of those zip codes. The number one in New York City was the West Village Meatpacking District. Right. Sort of fascinating, you wouldn't think that, right? You would think it would be the Upper West Side or certainly the Upper East Side with the whole Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue demographic, but there's just a, obviously a tremendous amount of... Um, so give us a little hype, tell us what you're building. You know, how many, you, you said 102 garage spots, a pool, you know, you're gonna have a, a driveway <laughs> in like like the Apthorpe, you know, what is this? Come on, you know. I, I only wanna sell an apartment to you, Mike. I can't afford it. He's selling them for you. Okay, I'm selling it for you. I, but but that's what you, you you're imagining. It's, it's envisioning. No, we we have a site that that um, we work with the community on, um, and we've begun um, we've begun excavating and demolition. 
And it's, it's going to be contextual to the village. We're actually keeping the existing warehouse structure downstairs, which is really going to be, going to be very special with very, very high ceilings. And there's going to be an interior garden and a drive through So I think it's going to be, it's going to be a very special building. And a world-class architect. You, you and a world-class architect. Great, and architect. So, so here's the question. You've been on Bond Street. You've been in other areas. Is there, a, is there a additional space? What else can be built? You know, because there's not that much over there. What, what can be built in this West Village meatpacking district? Oh, it, it, I mean, you like that neighborhood. You want to go there. You went to Bond Street. You've gone to Tribeca. You've been in other neighborhoods, and now you're over here. You know, we, we like, you know, A locations. If you look, you know, Tribeca, you know, Bond Street, the meatpacking district. The, the interesting thing about the meatpacking district and the West Village is most of it is landmarked. And so, you know, you have to work with the community, you know, work with the city to do something that's contextual, something that fits with the neighbors, fits with the existing properties in the area. And we're very good at that. We've worked with landmarks before, you know, we've worked with the city before, the, the community boards. So, so we actually like that. We think it's an opportunity for us and an opportunity for, for people like Steve who can do the same thing. I know Paul's done it as well. Given that, there are limitations as to what can be built. So if you work through that process and you're patient and you take the time, you can actually, you know, end on the other side with a very nice, well-designed product. You can do very well, and there, there's competition that's somewhat limited in that, you know, if it would take someone else, you know, five years to replicate what you did. I think the opportunity that um, is sitting there waiting for Steve and Joe is the it's basic economic supply and demand. There's a tremendous demand for people to live in that area, and very limited supply for a luxury product. You can buy a townhouse in the West Village. You can go live in a uh, Bing and Bing building, which is nice, but it's old school, low ceilings, um, you know, classic pre-war buildings. There's no great new luxury product, even like the Caledonia that has a gym, has a beautiful roof deck. These are the key components that are creating the astronomical values that people like Joe and Steve but, will attain. But I think it's also, Jared, more fundamental there because it's really a nice place to live. Oh, it's beautiful. And people from all different um, stratas in life live there. You can, by the way, you can boat there. Sure. You can kayak there. But, but I think the I wasn't sure if Soho, who brought up one of the great dog facts. friendly. What dog the great friendly? fact that you'll find is I know many guys who brought up their families you know, somewhere in the Upper East Side. Now their kids have moved out. They're at the next stage of their life. And a lot of guys are now looking downtown. The wives would rather be downtown. There's an art scene downtown. Right. It's hipper. You, you it's, know, well, Steve you know, wants to. You know, my wife know, is thinking of moving to New York downtown. I'm going to give you a very downtown interesting Downtown has a vibe. You, you bought 111, and I still remember when the UJA moved down there, and there was an uproar by the UJA because the people didn't want the... the they were happy to take our buyout offer. Right. They were very happy to take <laughs> the buyout. Where were they located? They went to 111. They were in they 111. Did, they didn't want to be in UJC, 111. Yeah. UJC was in 111. It wasn't the neighborhood. They'd rather, at that time, be near Bloomingdale's. Right. And today, they probably say, oh, why didn't we go there? We could be in the meat packing district. They were a different sort of tenant. No, they're, they're, they're a different Their constituency tenant. comes from, from far away, their, their, their uh, tenant base. 111 has transformed to a building that appeals to a young, very highly paid, highly trained professional. Google, Nike, WebMD, uh, uh, Deutsche Advertising. <clears throat> the tenant base that is drawn to the meatpacking district, generally, like 111, are media companies, fashion forward, really sort of a different sort of tenant than traditional back so who, office. Who's the tenant now in your new office building? I mean, that office building, the five-story building that you're that you're opening over there. Well, it's a small building. It's an eighty thousand footer. We've leased uh, <clears throat> sixty percent of it. So, what type of tenants? Sir? Well, the ground and second floor is a retail tenant. Uh, a company called Our House, high-end furniture at a value point. Uh, they were opening their first store in New York. They wanted to be in the meatpacking district. They're building a beautiful store. They're opening in a few months, and I, I'm really hopeful they'll do great. A wonderful company. The top floor tenant is a uh, uh, peninsula-based, ca California-based software company. Uh, we found a lot of tech companies like the, the, the West Village Meatpacking District for quality of life. These are guys who show up every day. None of them wear suits and ties. They're all in jeans. 
uh, they're rather brilliant and they like the environment and the feeling and it's and that's why Google chose it. It's a there's a lot of reasons why the tenant who who doesn't need to be on Park Avenue would rather be there. And it's and it's a great place to go to lunches, stay live in the neighborhood, et cetera. We have one floor in the negotiation right now with a a media advertising company, edgy, cool branding company. I mean, the, the types of tenants that are attract office tenants can be in any sector. They're not your traditional banks, pretty much. They're more the sort of forward, younger type of tenants. But you probably would get a <clears throat> advertising agency or a media company or somebody like that who's into that. I mean, there's also a rent situation. People are, you know, your rent's in no, that it's $28 no a square foot, like on the show the week I had before on 8th Avenue and, 40, and 34th to 30, 40th Street. This is, a know, cheaper, this is a more expensive market than those. That's correct. What do you, what do you rent there, Paul? For the very big space, like a 111, if we were renting 111 today, and Google, since they bought it, we're not really renting space, but that peaked, well, that peaked, but that got to right 50. last year, sort of 53 to $55 a foot for the office space. Like what this, about your new building? Higher, because it's smaller, But, but you gorgeous, know what's interesting? Eric Garau was on the show the week before, and he said they own an office building, a small right office yeah. building on 14th and 8th. It's not so small, by the way. It, for them, it might be small. It, it's it, about two, 300,000 people. Correct, but the building was an old union building. He says that people over there, you talk about uh, with shag carpet, and they're only getting $30, $32 a foot. Correct, but let's face it. I love the Garals. They're partners of ours. They didn't put any money into the no. building. They're not trying. They don't. They said their partner in that the building was, doesn't want to put any they, money. They just want to the preserve their capital. Of any of the four guys sitting here, we would dress it up. We could dress it up dramatically, appeal to a different type of tenant, and get a higher rent. Okay, you know, you speak about that <coughs> on the corner of Fourteenth and Eighth. You had a Dean and DeLuca. Yes, went out. went out of business, yes. correct? And on the other side, you had a condominium who had retail. Yes, and that didn't do too well. Why wasn't that retail? doing that well on 8th Avenue as opposed to 9th Avenue. Jared, any? Oh, I think the, the density and the traffic is, is totally night and day. The amount of people that are going to the meatpacking, it's not about the... It's see, not the, the person some, getting off the subway There's on something 8th about Avenue. the meatpacking district. Some, people, it doesn't have the... So the people who go to the meatpacking district don't take the subway. Well, and they, they do. They some do. of them they do, do, but there, there are barriers, barriers to entry in the meatpacking district, but they're all broken through because people want to be there. It's a destination. 14th and 8th, you have the people that wor work in the area, live in the area. So what's the they might walk by so and what's shop. what's the difference in rent? By the way... For retail rent on 8th Avenue, like 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 8th. I double suppose, or more. I would what? think mid-block, 8th Avenue, 150. But I'll only disagree with you that it's not doing well. well. Five I, years ago, it was a $60 building. Now, rents. No, now it's $120 rent. No, no, it's done but, pretty well. What I'm yeah. saying, look at, the dif <laughs> look at the differential just for the yes. one block. It's a lot one, of differential. It's, it's a major differential. You also have a number of retailers on, on 14th Street between 9th and the River which is sort of the fashion row, which are really high image uh, positions. You know, you've got tenants there who are big national or international companies who want to put a presence there for, in addition to doing sales out of the store, marketing. I, I and, think, you know something, you're bringing out a very important comment. A lot of stores on Madison Avenue in the Plaza District are really not retail stores. They're not making money. They're not making money. A foot. They're advertising. They're, they're advertising venues. Mm -hmm. They you have you want to be in that neighborhood. It was like Soho in certain markets. You wanted to be there, and up, you'd pay that type of rent. I mean, Apple, they wanted to be there. But they're, I mean, they're doing the business. They're they were unique. doing. I mean, they're doing the business. It's it's a great store. The the concept. You know, I'd rather go there than going underground on Fifth Avenue, you know, it's just, a, it's a different world. The know? financial turmoil of 08 and 09 threw that all out the window. The tenants that are looking in the meatpacking district are very cautious and concerned about the volumes. They want to see how Theory is doing. They want to see how Vince and, uh, and Tory Burch are doing. They want to know if Alexander McQueen's doing business. And the fact is they are. Theory, it's their number one store chain-wide. Alexander McQueen's doing so well that two days ago in the Post, it, they announced that they're looking for another store. Where do they want to be for their second store, Alexander McQueen? Another store in the meatpacking district. The volumes are surging, and that's, that validifies that. The hotels. What's happening there, the hotels? The Gainsborough is still doing great. The Standard is doing great. Spectacular. Maritime, you know, is doing great. And now the Dream is opening up over there. That's why I want, people want to live down there. It's, and those hotels are very fashion forward, very edgy. They're bringing in a lot of cap money to the territory. If Washington Street 
was a tough street seven to ten years ago. Now it is it is it is transforming into what will be, I think, the third great street. Here's a question, time. really, for Joe uh, and you know uh, Stephen. Do you think, besides the New Yorkers who are buying apartments? you know, who bought at the Caledonia. Do you think we're going to see a lot of international people buying in your new, your new property and your property? I think uh, we will see non-New Yorkers, whether they're international. I mean, whether, I'm, whether I'm, they're out, you know, Midwest, you know, West Coast, et cetera. We've already, you know, we've been approached at several of our projects for people who they want a, a nice, well-designed um, home in New York City. And uh, I think they're, they're very drawn to the meatpacking district. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't think you need foreigners to um, to to sell in that market. I, I, no, I didn't say that. I, I was just asking. I, I think you can. Do I think sell they want to be there? Absolutely. I mean, we get calls. We can't talk to people today, but we get calls from them. But the West Village has its own I, I mean, clientele. You know, people just want to live there, and they want to live there, Mike, because it's just nice. You walk around; it's charming. Those cobblestone uh, streets. You get to Soho in Chinatown. And Little Italy is fast. The parks are fantastic. Parks are fantastic. And the people, it's just a nice place to live. Talk about the bid. What's what's the bid going to be doing, the Business Improvement District? Well, three of the guys here, and, and now a fourth, are members of, of MPIA, Meatpacking uh, Improvement Associates. It was formed essentially because the feeling amongst the real estate teams down there was that we were not being represented. Uh, Community Board 2... Uh, didn't have enough representation for the meatpacking district, and it, it's a it's a loved area that's not been maintained well enough. Um, Department of Transportation came in and made street side improvements up and down Ninth Avenue. They tried to be edgy and cool. What came out of it was instead something that most people consider to be edgy and ugly, kind of sort of raw cold. and and cold. And um, the feeling was that it should be done better. So a large group of land uh, property owners came together and met and created a, an executive committee, raised funds to basically take over the operations of the Ninth Avenue parks, at, or plazas, as it were. We're very close to finishing a deal with the Department of Transportation. We're close to getting approvals by the community board. And we're hoping that in the late spring, I was hoping the early spring, but let's say late spring, uh, all those plazas are going to be redesigned, redeveloped with new bollards, planters, seating, and, and make it a place where you'll comfortably go there and sit a mother on it with a stroller or someone will be sitting on their computer and working while they get a cappuccino from a local store or a Billy's Burger. And it'll, be, it'll just bring a lot of daytime traffic to this neighborhood, which is desperately needed. So 30 minutes is never uh, enough, especially with this group, to talk about what's happening in the uh, meatpacking district in the West Village. Uh, so I hope uh, on my 11th season next year, you'll all be back. I'd like to thank Joe McMillan, Jared Epstein, Paul Pariser, and needless to say, Steve Whitcoff. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman & Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns & Gian Tomasi, Grubb & Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa & Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, 
Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group.